Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, this episode is the third of episode of a nine part series of Uruguayan wine reviews. These are all free samples, so I have total autonomy in these reviews. Be sure to watch the first episode of the series for a more in-depth feature on Uruguayan wine. The short version is that wine has certainly been made in Uruguay since the early 1600s. However, it's not until, the 18, not until 1870 that the modern wine industry really begins in Uruguay. Today's wine comes from Bodega Cerro Chapeu. They are our farthest north winery all the way up in Rivetta, only about a half mile from the Brazilian border. I mean, you could say Brazil is in their backyard, literally. They started out as wine growers when uh, Cuico Carao Pujol began his search for land with the goal of planting the first virus-free vines. Now, I'll admit, I don't know exactly what they mean here. Yes, there are vines and vineyards that can have viruses, but you can plant virus-free wines. Maybe back in 1975, when he was getting all this started, it was harder to do than it is now. Even so, while some soils are better for viruses than others, virus resistance is also tied to grape variety and climate. Or maybe they're really talking about phylloxera, which isn't a virus, but a louse. And phylloxera has a harder time thriving in certain types of soil. I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, he was looking for qualities that would adapt to the climate of Uruguay, sandy soils and slopes that would allow good drainage of water to avoid excess water in the vine. You know, you know how I read all that? Soils that prevent the spread of phylloxera. Anywhere you have sandy soils, you'll find either an absence or at least a lack of phylloxera. There's a connection with sandy soils and their drainage that hinders the spread of phylloxera as it lives in the roots of the vines. All right, so he researched all over Uruguay for this land. And if you watched the first episode of the series, then you probably know why he chose the land up in Rivetta. Rivetta has sandy soils. He found a sandy, reddish, and deep soil with low fertility and very good drainage. Everything a phylloxera-resistant soil could want. Okay, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but it does have the hallmarks of, a, of an area that has a low chance of phylloxera spreading. He decided to plant Tanat Cabernet Sauvignon uh, Aranoa, that is a new one on me, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and then some others. So of course I had to look up Aranoa and like try to pronounce it 5,000 times. Um, it's a grape that was bred in Bordeaux in 1956 and is a cross between Tanat and Cabernet Sauvignon. That sounds tasty. I gotta get me some of that. It's also one of the four red and two white grapes approved for use in Bordeaux, uh, in Bordeaux beginning with the 2021 vintage from what I can tell, or maybe not till 2022. Either way, we may start seeing wines with these grapes in them as early as, well, maybe even this year. However, these grapes can only be used for wines labeled just Bordeaux or Bordeaux Superior, and only a maximum of 10% combined in a wine. And then an estate can't plant more than 5% in total of their entire land area uh, of the red varieties. And none of the grapes can be listed on the label. Damn BDX, like I get you're messing with tradition, but I'd like to know what's in a wine. I guess a winery's website can list it uh, on a text sheet. I mean, I hope so. Also, only 10% isn't really going to dramatically alter things. I mean, if you did a side-by-side -side of a wine with 10% of these grapes and one without, it's definitely possible to tell the difference. For the curious, here's the list. For the reds, we have the grape I can't pronounce, the Arenanoa, then Castets, though thought to be native to Bordeaux, Marcelon, my new favorite grape, Torriga Nacional, the main grape in port wine. For the whites, we have, well, Alborino, Free of Spain and also Portugal, Lilor Ila, a cross between a grape called Baroque, a very rare grape in southwest France, and then Chardonnay. Uh, these new grapes are in response to climate change in Bordeaux. Many of these grapes are ones that have later bud break, they retain acidity better, they're resistant to disease, and they ripen later so that you're not harvesting in August or even earlier like we do in Texas. Okay, back to Uruguay. In 1997, Francisco Corral, the youngest son of Cuico, designed their winery. 
He's listed on the website as the ninth generation, but I'm not sure why is Querco is the first family member we see. Maybe the family had been in Uruguay or even Europe as wine growers for many, many uh, generations. But the website doesn't go back farther than 1975 to give us details on this. With all that said, they have a total of 40 hectares of vineyards. Anyway, so Francisco designed this gravity-fed winery uh, in a flat top hill after visiting wineries from all around the world. The website claims that this is the first gravity-fed winery in Uruguay. The advantage of gravity-fed wineries is the lack or absence of pumps in moving wine around the winery. This movement via pumps typically means additions of SO2 each time to prevent premature oxidation. He also isolated the native yeast from the vineyard for use in their winemaking. This can give you more consistency in winemaking as native ferments can be a bit tricky. My guess is he isolated the best performing ones and uses those to quote inoculate the must rather than using commercial yeasts. It's no different than having your sourdough yeast that you keep going from batch to batch, batch to batch, just on a much, much larger scale and more precision. He also developed a research program dedicated to careful clonal selection. He's got a pretty major science background, you know, has a doctorate in chemistry in yeast and wine aromas from how the website puts it. I hope Francisco approves of all the stuff I'm slinging here in other episodes. Anyway, as far as climate, we are in a more continental climate. That means high temperatures range from as low as 55 degrees in July and as high as 77 degrees in January. That's their summer. For the lows, they range from a low of 46 degrees in July and a high of 66 uh, in January. So you can, and you can get heat waves and cold snaps that will push you to the extremes, but it's still a pretty temperate uh, climate. In addition to all that, there's the Pampero, the south wind. It's a cold wind off the Atlantic Ocean that can bring relief during a heat wave. This is because you have really a lack of mountains and other weather barriers in, in Uruguay. That's really throughout the whole country. It's all, it also contributes to the high humidity and fog, which are both common. When it comes to rainfall, Rivera is considered the wettest part of the country with an annual rainfall of over 1,500 millimeters or 60 inches. The back label and the website do talk about sustainability and a hands-off approach to things. But just like all the wines in the series, there's no sustainable certification, even though the INAVI has a program. I'm wondering if it's just so new that the search just haven't started showing up yet. With that said, I totally believe that they are a sustainable winery or at least implement many sustainable practices. So when it comes to the wines, this one is part of their folklore line of wines. The website says these aim to continue with the innovation that characterizes the Castel Pujol brand and spirit with these blends from the Cerro Chapeu vineyards made with alternative vinifications. All right, so translation, these wines are their low interventionist wines. Some may say natural, but I prefer low interventionist. It does have many of the hallmarks of a natty wine, native yeast, no fining, no filtering, only adding SO2 at bottling, etc. Now let's get the stats for the wine. The 2021 Cerro Chapeu Castel Pujol Folklore Blanco. The suggested retail price is $20. It's from Rivetta. It is 70% Trebbiano, 30% Malvasia. It's hand harvested, harvested early to keep the ABV lower. It's native fermentation for six months in stainless steel. It's unfined, it's unfiltered. This is the reason for the six months as all the solids naturally fall out. Though there may be a bit of haze, uh, the minimal SO2 at bottling. I'd like to know exactly what this number is, as in some of the Chilean Sauvignon Blancs, I did have this number. It's vegan. The ABV is 11.5%, pH is 3.3. The TA, the total city, is 4.3 grams per liter. Now, given the pH, it's, this is probably the tritatable acidity, like a lot of the Sauvignon Blancs from Chile we're using. And the RS is 1.5 grams per liter. One final thing to note is the artwork on the front label. It is from artist Nicolas Sanchez, a muralist known as Alfalfa. Don't ask me why, but I think that's a pretty cool name. Uh, each label for this series of wines was inspired by the animals that inhabit the vineyards dressed in gaucho clothing. All right, packaging is everything, and uh, these are pretty cool labels. I'd at least pick it up, you know, just to check, check it out. And the back label has enough geekiness and buzzwords to inspire a purchase. All right, with all that said, let's get into the wine. Alrighty. I mean, I know that the, the spinning thing, but the back label does have a bunch of stuff. Um, 
one of the things I was, I thought I was going to say something. No, it said everything here. I already talked about everything on here. Yep, yeah, never mind. It was all in the stats. I thought there was something on the back label that I wanted to point out, but it was already in the stats. Another thing is kind of interesting. Now, I talked about in the first episode about VCP and um, VC as far as wine quality le uh, levels in, in Uruguay. So this wine, along with the very first wine in the series that I'm doing, they're the only two that have this kind of um, seal. And it says VCP on there and it has like a number. I'm assuming this is a tracking number. Um, none of the other wines have those. So, you know, I'm wondering how much the stuff I have been talking about the last few episodes is so new that it may not have gotten to some of these things. I mean, this is a 21 vintage, right? This is 21. The uh, Don Pasquale was 22, I believe. 22. Um, but the Traversa was a 22. So, you know, who knows? Well, but I will say the Traversa does have on, I thought it said on the back label VCP. No. I mean, each bottling has certain things. Like some of them will have like the IN, AV, IN AVI and they'll have like a number next to it. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely some differences in how they label everything. But enough of that. Okay, this is definitely has some aromatics to it. So Trebbiano um, is the Italian name for basically Uni Blanc. I mean, there's different Trebbianos in Italy, but this is probably Trebbiano Toscano, and that's Uni Blanc in France. And they make a lot of brandy. That's the main grape for brandy is Uni Blanc, like Cognac, Armagnac, that type of stuff. But you can get, I mean, they make Trebbiano wines in Italy and you get Uni Blanc wines in France. So I get kind of a peach and orange aroma off of this. It's slightly, slightly ripe. It's not like super, super ripe. Um, they did harvest early. And harvesting early means you're going to get a, a less ripe version of the fruit. It's also going to help retain acidity. And one of the things about acidity, especially if you're trying to be a low interventionist with wine, the higher your acidity or really the lower your pH, uh, the better it is for preservation. Yeah, I get a little touch of floral out of it. Yeah, and I mean, nothing really, nothing really that's just like jumping out of the glass. So let's just get into this. It's definitely tasty. I uh, like it. It's got that bit of kind of mango, orange, papaya. So it's a little more on the tropical fruit side of things. But it's got that good citrus thing, the orange, also got a little lemon lime. It's really bringing up that acidity, that, that brightness to the wine. Um, they're all like in that just ripe category. There's another, I think it's really the guava that I'm getting, but there's like another flavor I feel like I'm missing out on that, that, that I, I'm having a hard time describing. But I think it's really more the guava. There's a touch of white flowers. There's no oak on this wine, so you're not gonna gain the oak influences and that type of stuff. And I feel like they, you know, uh, even though it's a gravity fed, because it is a gravity fed winery, um, they're trying to minimize the oxidation throughout the process. So since they only added SO2 at the bottle, you know, at bottling, um, there shouldn't be too much oxidation going on here. Oh, I know I was going to say, they said it's fermented for six months. It really wasn't fermenting for six months. It was in the fermentation vessel for six months. That's what I was trying to remember. It tastes good. It's not terribly expensive. You know, it's what, uh, what was it, 15, 16 bottles? <laughs> bottles, 20 bucks. Okay, 20 bucks. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not cheap by any means. Um, it tastes good. I like it. This is definitely a wine that you could just kind of chill with. Um, you don't necessarily need food with this, but it's going to be like the typical like light fare type of stuff, you know, salads type of thing or just hanging out on the porch or the pool or the beach or just in your house on a nice spring day. Yeah. Sitting under a tree somewhere, reading a book. People do read books still, right? I know I don't really read any actual books anymore, but it's always on my, on my electronics, but it tastes really good. There's nothing complex about it. It's not a life-changing wine. It doesn't need to be a life-changing wine. This is a wine that's just meant to taste good. Um, and it's not Sauvignon Blanc. It's not, 
Chardonnay, you know, it's not Pinot Grigio. It's not your like typical white wine stuff. It's just something a little different. It gives you a little bit different character. Um, it's not the same old, same old white wines, which I, I don't know if they, maybe they, maybe, well, they have Chardonnay plants. I don't remember that. But no, I think it tastes really good. Yeah. All right, so that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends. And we'll see you next time.